so I don't know, lads, you know, like, um, I guess, you know, to sort of start talking about this, have you guys seen that, like, GPT-4 came out this week? The, like, the new version of, uh, of the, uh, the, the AI? Yeah, uh, they said it's better than human beings. That's what I saw on yeah, Twitter. Yeah, smarter, smarter on, 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 like, LSATs and shit. On right? all these exams. No, that's yeah. a serious thing. I mean, I don't know how hard, I mean, I guess the LSAT's probably hard, but... Um, well, you know, you know, the funny thing, I, I mean, it's, it's a good, it's a good way to think about it. You know, I, I remember, um, maybe we even joked about it online, but like my first experiment playing with chat GPT was something like, while I was still at the Atlantic council was like chat GPT, write me a grant proposal, you know, for $150,000 <laughs> on like regional economic integration for the Western Balkans. And it did a really freaking good job. Uh, not like. You could take co copy and paste it and you know submit it, but like it did a decent enough job and not like not all that rote either because I was specific enough in my request to to make it like somewhat technical, and um, it 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 like really highlighted to for me the extent to which what ChatGPT is good at is um, is stuff that that we think we need human beings to do because we think it requires human stuff. But actually, if you think about it in terms of like machines, like sending signals and messages to each other where things need to be, you know, if you've done any programming, like if you're writing a program that communicates with other programs, you have a format of the message that needs to be sent. And the message needs to include data, 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 data. And then, and then, like you fill those things in into the sort of data structure, and that's how you like systems communicate with each other. And it, it dawned on me, it's like you're just, you're just like you're just like describing university bureaucracy. Well, like, any straight, bureaucracy straight really, yeah. or or grant making, <laughs> yeah, like you yeah. know, with with like think tanks and, yeah. and and like NGOs and stuff like that. Is there's a grant making institution and like the grantee, and the grantee needs to set a perfectly formatted message yeah, to yeah. the other system, which takes the message, is able to parse out what it's about. There's a lot of fluff there in this thing like that encodes the, <laughs> the, the data. Yeah. The other machine goes boop, 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 and it's populated by human beings that are all like boop, 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 yeah. boop, and then it like craps out a message like, yes, you get the grant. No, yeah, so, you don't get the grant. So, you know? so this, this is not an argument that uh, that ChatGPT is human. This is an argument that university administrators are not human. Well, this but this a, this yeah. gets this gets to the the, the core of, of of my essay and why we thought we'd have you on, Sam. Which you know, I I I don't know again if I've said it out loud yet, but like I I you know I wrote that essay sort of as a provocation, uh, and I, I think of it as a provocation to you, Sam, and uh, sort of a goad to Shadi to sort of you know push on and in. in uh, the way he thinks about it and talks about, uh, you know, the individual human agency, uh, you know, dignity and all the other things that are important to, for a functioning democracy. And we'll include a link in the show notes to your essay. What was it titled, Demir? Um, Chat something GPT and Me. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's great. It's great, great title. <laughs> that is a good title. Yeah, that was like an 11 o'clock p.m. title <laughs> idea. Okay, so I just want to put something out there. And I want to just offer a disclaimer to people. I stopped following the news, so I don't really know a whole lot of things. Yeah, good. I practice what I preach. Yeah, you, you, know? you preached it in the Atlantic, said the only way to happiness is to stop following the news. You know, Here I, was, I am. I, I, was, I, was, I was, you know, to, to just do a little side note on that, I think it was a great essay in the Atlantic, and I think people should go and read it. We'll also put it in the show notes. But you didn't put in my favorite and earliest proponent of this worldview. Do you remember, we've talked about him on the show before, uh, Aaron Swartz, that kid who ended up committing yeah. suicide oh. after, after, you know, he had, I think, went to MIT and downloaded most of the, like, journals the academic journals that were at one of the big databases and was just yeah. gonna like release them and they locked yeah. him up and he killed himself yeah. in jail yeah. he had uh he had an essay which i'll dig up the link to and also put in the show notes called uh i hate the news or something like that huh. and this was i don't know that's I, a, I yeah that's an amazing that's an amazing it's thing. such a short essay and he just makes the point it's just like most of the news is actually irrelevant to me and he even goes further and more provocatively says like you know being like up on the news we like to think as like participants in a democracy you know we need to be up on the news like this is our duty as citizens is to be up on the news and he's like that's bullshit like look at any any newspaper story how many times it gets corrected how many times you know things change and how many times in the course of a week the story develops like how important it is me is it for me to know every 
you know, turn. It's like, instead of a, a news, I will read a magazine. Instead of a magazine, I'll read a book. And maybe the best thing to do is, like, before I vote once every, you know, two or four years, depending, I'll just read, like, a brief on what the issues are and, and try and figure out, like, at that point, what's important. But, like, actually being abreast of the news is not important, you know? Yeah, and I think it's even plausible to me that let's imagine a citizenry where no one read any news. Yeah. I think that the electoral outcomes could be, you know, potentially better. Like it's it's unclear to me that if if you and, had wait, like any any news, well, I guess no. that wouldn't work because then then they wouldn't know how to get to the polls and stuff. So there are complications. <laughs> no, but, you could you um, could you, the authorities could just you know like <laughs> mail out like instructions. That's like how instructions. To go poll. That's just like driving directions. Yeah, driving that seems, directions. That seems easier. Yeah, yeah, true. But I guess what I was really getting at, um, wait, yeah, okay, so. Because I don't follow the news as much, I, I'm not totally up to speed on the chat GPT um, version number four. I did, however, run across an article briefly on Twitter um, where it was very pessimistic. It was saying because human, uh, sorry, uh, because AI is now showing that it can outperform humans, that the chances of the world ending are 33%. That's like in, Scott in, in, Alexander's piece, yeah. Oh yeah, Scott Alexander. Yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah, yeah. a piece. I didn't finish he, reading that one. It looked really good. Yeah, and I, he, and it, it pointed me to that. There's like this entire doom universe of people who are like really I mean, worried about this stuff. So and like, he was the optimistic one. Yeah. So Scott Alexander in that he's like, here are all the other people who have made public predictions and they're like fifty percent, sixty percent, that sort of thing. And he's like, here's the optimistic view. Only thirty three percent chance the world will end. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, we're going to talk about philosophy of mind here, but um, actually, like, one of the bigger interfaces with philosophy and this topic over the past several decades is this, like, existential risk kind of field. Yeah. And that, I mean, has been, like, wild proliferation of ways to make you depressed about the future of the world. And, I mean, AI is always, like, very high up on this. And, and you know, this is, like, tied to that part of philosophy that has been under ignominy recently because of... Uh, of Sam Bankman Freed and the whole Will McCaskill universe. Like the EA people, the effective altruism people are, have been like very, very interested in this kind of like long term can humanity survive things things can like you, AI Can you can you maybe tell us a bit more about this subdiscipline, ex yeah. existential risk? I'm not familiar. And with I mean that. And, and more than let me impress you a bit more on that. Like I never delved into it on in the Sam Bankman Freed stuff because the little scratching I did of effective altruism, it seemed like such rank hackery and like dumb, like millennial, like bullshit that, <laughs> that like, it just like, I, I, I dismissed well, so it almost out of hand. But let me say one more thing about that. At the same time, you have these other people like Eric Schmidt and like Kissinger writing pieces about like AI destroying the world. And, and it's like, I think Kissinger is too old, quite frankly, to even understand what AI is, even though he's a smart guy. But like Eric Schmidt, I'm like, okay, so Kissinger's talking to Schmidt, and Schmidt's probably writing these things with Kissinger's like sparkling some some geopolitics into it. But like, uh, like Sam, convince us in like human terms that this is not just fucking gobbledygook futurism with, that like involves in some sense this concept of the fucking singularity, which is another <laughs> annoying concept that Silicon Valley people love to like hump. I mean, you're you're asking me to defend. Uh, yeah, one of my the very least, my like very <laughs> least favorite parts of my discipline. Just explain so, it. Explain okay. it for 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 mortals. Okay, I mean, like the background to this part of the discipline is utilitarianism. Mm -hmm. So, Peter Singer in particular is a kind of primary figure as you like sort of trace out this like millennial tech bro philosophy kind of overlap thing. Mm. The basic idea is that the moral system that we should be running is one that maximizes something like happiness or the greatest good like one of these kind of like vague shadowy terms that no one actually knows what they're that, that no one like really defines really carefully for you and then they say okay given the fact that that's our goal maximizing x term for the greatest number of people we need to think not just in like very localized ways um and actually people is like an interesting question there like singer like famously doesn't think that the like the the entities for which you're maximizing are just humans. Like he thinks that you need to expand that range in all kinds of ways. Um, but a funny but, side note about Peter Singer. Yeah, I think yeah. you're the one who told me about it, and it was hilarious when you showed it to me. You showed <laughs> me. Let's like, definitely his include Amazon, this in the show notes. <laughs> his Amazon book page, which has all of his book covers, they all 
have his face on. Like it's just like <laughs> Peter Singer is the cover of all of his different books in different positions, like with different expressions. It's incredible. It's like no, it's like looking through his like um his like aging fo- photo album. It's yeah. like s- sort of flip through, and you're like, oh, like middle aged Peter Singer, like less middle aged Peter Singer, like actually old Peter Singer. That's. Um, <laughs> This is like why they're worried in the fu- worried about the future because like it just looks like it's not going that well for him <laughs> specifically. <laughs> um, no, so I mean the you know the upshot of this is then people say okay like if we need to pay attention to benefit for humanity let's not just consider currently existing human beings let's consider our species well into the future or possibly like successors to our species. This is where it like overlaps with transhumanism mm-hmm. and. So then you get these kind of models which say saving humanity from uh, like major cataclysm is a more important goal than, say, currently alleviating poverty in San Francisco. And so you get this kind of um, recalibration of a philanthropic industry to say, let's just pay attention in like what they call like the most rational way possible to the actual stakes at hand and then calibrate our philanthropic giving right um accordingly and like you know there are some aspects like we all have a friend who's in the um it's this has been like um uh like the philosophy salon um month on wisdom of crowds so osita and i uh who was on last time uh set up this reading group thing that demir you you're both part of and one of the people that's been in that group uh is um dylan matthews who famously like donated a kidney based upon this kind of hmm. um wait really yeah i didn't know that yeah yeah and i mean has was very involved in ea early on and um and it's interesting i mean he's he'd be a really interesting guest to have on at some point to kind but of But he's sorry about. he donated a kidney for the future no i mean specifically on this kind of like less Logic. less the long long termism part of ea oh, and okay. more the okay how do i understand the resources that are on my side and then how to maximize those. Okay. After uh, I've just slagged off an yeah. entire sort of yeah. subset well, of people who follow this, this <laughs> idea, we should have him on and yeah. Okay. I'll be nicer next time then. No, but I mean, it's just to say that like, you know, even if uh, I think we're pretty agreed that there's a lot of this, that's like, it's not too bad that it's deflated. There are also some interesting parts that like, Oh, that's actually kind of inspirational. So where's um, AI get into this then? Like what's their take on uh, AI? Beca- because AI looks like one of these like sort of large, large risk categories and so you have um the center for existential risk at oxford that was famously like kind of doing this stuff uh probably i don't know when it was set up maybe late 90s early 2000s that started looking at this and ai was one of their principal kinds of risk factor things um and that has played it played up in all kinds of other and like you know like even people like elon musk that have been like worried about this um have 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 also like played played it but so look influenced by that nick bostrom you know, I, 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 I sort of follow the, the existential risk. I, let, me, let me throw out two things. Maybe we can talk about a little bit more of the existential risk. Um, I mean, I, th- I think the philosophy of mind stuff is more interesting. I think it's more interesting, too. But yeah. let, let, let's stick with it for a sec. Because, like, yeah. look, um, I mean, maybe you can explain, like, what the, the, the real worry of existential risk is. I mean, I started skimming the, the, the Alexander, Scott Alexander piece that Shadi was talking about. And it's it's it seems to sort of hinge on the idea that like these things will get smart, um, and I think there's a great line at the beginning, something like you know they will they share they have values different they develop values different from our own, including like the worship of paper clips, yeah. and like yeah. Yeah. and they will as a result in the pursuit of the defense of paper clips develop super weapons to wipe us out. Like I mean okay, sort of you know, and I, I take. The premise that these things are moving very quickly and everyone's concerned that, you know, we've had in the course of six months, you know, going from zero ability to model language to something that is pretty convincingly doing it. And apparently ChatGPT 3.5 to 4.0 itself is like a huge leap in the course of three months or four months or whatever. I mean, it's it's something and it's happening pretty quickly. But, you know, I mean, I guess my question is what do you think of that or what do you both think about like that sort of existential threat i guess I, I i still struggle to see it and maybe just throw out the other thing like what i think is more interesting about it especially for the three of us and for you know um useless people like us it's that like i i think we've always felt pretty good about being able to use technology to uh stay ahead of the curve and technology up until now has displaced people at different you know with different skill sets and rendered entire 
generations uh, in like economic peril as a result. I mean, I, I think the the more interesting thing of like real threat from chat GPT is that all of us that write, uh, we may really be struggling to figure out and like completely recalibrate to what our jobs entail in the future. You know, I, I, I have a sense that like the real sort of disruption will come in in our world, which has up until now only been helped at the margins by automation and other things. Like I think parts of what we do are just are likely to be automated and like changed uh, in ways that like we, we haven't yet even begun to anticipate. So I think it's it's our sort of elite knowledge class, those workers that are really screwed going forward. I don't think, Demir, that AI can replicate our opinion, my opinions for sure, but. I, I, you should I, try it. See, there, there was I, there was a naughty tweet uh, out out there that said uh, that asked uh, to you know to write uh, uh, in the voice of Joe Biden when he decided to defend transgender rights. I won't quote it here because it'll get me canceled, but I will put it in the show notes. So <laughs> the person whoever tweeted that can be canceled. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, what, all I meant to say there is that you can ask ChatGPT in the voice of Shadi Hamid. Now, I think it doesn't have. I have. Trust Hamid, me, I have. It is not the real thing. It's not there yet, though. Like, I, I think that because that's the thing that's coming down the pike on this is I will be able to probably soon, maybe even with ChatGPT4, is like take a subset of texts, i.e. download everything you've written that I can find online, feed it to it and say, focus on this. And this is what you're working from. Um, now, you know, you're much more prolific than me, so you're in more trouble than I am. Like, there's not enough of it to work on for me. But the more you write, the more replicable you might be. Wow. Okay, interesting. But I, I do want to say something about um, existential <laughs> no, no, this, like, risk before he's, he's, we. He's yeah, just saying ahead. you're not going to have to work as hard. Like you're just like write write my Atlantic essay for me, and then like it's it shows. Yeah, up. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Maybe. Maybe. But, Go on, Shetty, Yeah. Okay. The existential risk stuff. I honestly have a lot of trouble grasping it. It doesn't resonate with me at a very fundamental level. And let's just go straight to first principles. I think that. Look, I've said that I've said things to this effect in previous episodes, and I hope it I hope it doesn't sound like too oversimplified, but um, I don't think God will allow an alien species to come and defend paper clips or whatever you know scenario you just said. Like, it's not as if anything is possible. If you believe in God, then only certain things are possible. The realm of possibility is is constrained in some basic sense. So I don't have this same sense of panic about the future. The world, you know, the world will end presumably like with God's, God's ascent. And, oh, you know, I, right. I just, this is not beyond like, but why, 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 why are we the favored creatures? Why? I mean, maybe it's not revealed yet. And God has put us on this earth to give birth to the paperclip overlord AI that, and we're just, no, we're, but well, we're, because maybe I we're like in... a snake skin. And like, I we'll believe... just be shed off. Like, I, I mean, that's just theology, but maybe God didn't tell you the whole truth. No, but, have access to all but I also believe in scripture. And I think if that was really the case, then God would have like dropped some hints in, in the relevant scripture. And to, you know, to my knowledge, he hasn't on that particular issue. Because he, he loves you so much, he would never lie to you. Well, no, I don't, no, I don't, yeah, I, I don't think God um, lies to his creation. Hmm. No, I don't think, I mean, I guess, he could. I mean, if God is all powerful, then theoretically he can do anything. But, um, pr but God can't go against his own stated laws. So, if God is the the most trustworthy, the most, um, uh, you know, all the names of God or attributes of God that we can think of, he can't go against his own attributes. But I mean, that's a bigger theological conversation. To what extent God can go beyond himself, and you know whether that just like creates an endless set of paradoxes but like it is it is relevant because it's like a question of whether contingency is everything and that that's sort of i think what the philosophy of mind conversation is about also so like is the way you get to setting up a center for existential risk at oxford is you think um there are maybe you don't even need like endless contingencies so you could just say the parameters are really wide like uh god's not gonna allow the whole universe to get wiped out, but he would let this planet get wiped out. And then you say, let's pattern out the whole range of contingency. And, you know, they've worked on all kinds of stuff. I mean, 
uh, the questions like about whether our entire reality is just a simulation from like a grade school classroom of a higher species, you know, that that's why it's like so wonky. Wait, does, does like, anyone so really think that? Like, help me out here because I'm not familiar with that, uh, with those ideas. Is is the argument that it's theoretically possible that we're living in a simulation or do some people actually think that we are living in a simulation? So it's, again, part of this sort of philosophy that's very different than my own disposition. The way they tend to do it is like probabilistically. So they'll say, hey, look, video games in the 80s looked like, like, you know, eight pixels, like hitting a thing with three pixels back and forth between, you know? And then like, now look at what video games look like. What's the probability that uh, some, like either our species or like a higher species wouldn't eventually get to the point where they could simulate something like the whole universe. Um, and so the, and so then, like, once you do that, then you say, what's the probability that our universe hasn't been previously simulated in this kind of way? Mm. And so then they say, yeah, actually, there's, like, a pretty good chance. Um, but again, I, simulation. I like Given what we now some... know about te technology, it looks like we're probably in the matrix. These people are sound like clowns. This is, this is like, ludicrous stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, I mean... It gets down to, I mean, I think it, it does get down to, this is why this strikes me as, as like good fodder for us, um, is that these are first principles questions. It's like, where do you, where do you begin your inquiry from, you know, and where, what do you ground your, your, your starting principles at? You know, again, it, it comes down to, do you, do you ground everything in, a, in an assertion about individuals existing and having attributes like dignity and you know, that we need to respect those things and, you know, that rights flow from that, whatever those rights might be, however you define them, and you, you sort of build everything from that. Or do you say that, like, well, you know, I don't know, you call all of that into question. And then, you know, and then the, the problem for me, Sam, with how you, you describe that is, uh, is probabilities. You know, I mean, I find, I find it yeah. challenging even, like, talking to people who say, like, work in intel agencies and um, in... Uh, um, in government and and you know i as i understand it their assessments always are like you know they they have to put um uh, probability assessments on like a, this yeah 30 percent confidence in x but but you know what i mean like but but you're looking at you're looking at 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 expert opinion and it's really weird to me it's always been weird to me when experts assign numbers to like conf you know there's there's something that a confidence interval means in statistics and then there's something that like an individual saying is like I'm 30% confident that something's happened is going to happen. It's an absurd like sleight of hand. Like 30% is not equal to 30% in that sense. It's yeah. not the same fucking thing, right? Yeah. yeah. And so so like you know oh yeah we're not we're we're so you dodge the first principles question and we're like oh we're just dealing with probabilities and yeah okay we go from pong to to like you know. Um, I don't I mean, know what, like even Halo, in, and now you're like, and therefore there's a chance, or well, sure, I guess there's a chance, but there's a chance of anything if you really put it that way. Yeah. It's like, oh, I, oh, it's it's a pretty good probability. I mean, but like, it's a, it's that's an abuse of language as far as I'm concerned. It's not a probability. It's just basically you you if you cast everything off, everything's possible, right? Ultimately, well, I mean, it's worth. It's worth saying that, like, even in statistics, you get that problem, right? So there's a lot, of, there's a lot more judgment going on in statistical modeling than people usually realize. So, like, where you set your p-value for a given study yeah. matters a lot for what the conclusions are that you come out with. And usually, you just have to decide. You're P like, being oh, okay. population is what you're talking about, like what you're sampling in these things. No, the right? prob prob probability. So, like, okay. so it's where it's where you say, okay, like this is a salient result versus a yeah. non salient. Like, this, is yeah. this noise or is this like actually something that we're going to trust? And yeah. so, the degree of confidence that you're going to put in that is a matter of judgment. You're like, okay, like at this at this for this particular topic that we're thinking about, like it should be set really really tight. Like we we're not going to like allow a lot of chance that we got uh, false positives here or you're going to say no like it's fine like we'll just kind of accept it and so it you know i think elite one of the things that is important when you're talking about how it's it's actually one of the reasons why i like this project that we're doing so much is that when people who are really serious about thinking are thinking they realize like just how much uncertainty is involved like the questions that we're talking about here what is contingency um, is the universe real? Like how, you know, these are questions that no, truly no smart person, like this is not like, you know, like 
whatever they wheel out Stephen Hawking and then like he knows everything like that there just is no such person in the world like they're yeah. just it doesn't exist so whatever discipline you're talking about whether you know so disciplines like theoretical physics um th theoretical mathematics metaphysics and philosophy ep epistemology usually like these are considered like the sort of top of the academic heap and the very best people in all of those disciplines have no idea about the like primary questions in their disciplines like there's a certain level of stuff that we all know and that we like our pr premises that we're working from but it's also the case that when you're talking about the like biggest questions of humanity there's a huge amount of uncertainty and judgment mm -hmm. and so and i think it's one of the like miscommunication things that happens with politics I, I actually think this is really relevant to the political debates that we're having which is you kind of have sort of how it's structured is you have that class of people all of whom have phds doing research at harvard when they're talking to each other they're like i don't know like here like here's where my uncertainty is if you go read journal articles it starts with uh, here's a bunch of stuff no one knows, and I'm going to tell you sort of how I might think about it. When that stuff gets uh, taught to whatever undergraduates and maybe master's students who then end up in communicating it externally, they're like, all of the experts think such and such thing, which is tr genuinely never, ever, ever true. And so, and the po you know, the larger population knows that. They know that reality is hard and that, you know, figuring out what's real is difficult. And so, the lack of um, communicating that with a kind of s circumspection means people are like, oh, ex experts are bullshit. Like, what, why are we going to trust any of this stuff? And so I, I, think that, I think there is like a political question that's like lurking beneath that that's actually really interesting. So to say more about that political question that's lurking. I think that the political question is uh, humanity lives in a state of uncertainty. That's just a genuine background fact for every human that's ever existed for our whole political it's why actually i think existential risk stuff can be kind of interesting is that it presses you to say hey what if nothing else exists like what like what if it all goes away what if mozart what if the whole planet dies like there's a kind of this is an ambiguity that you actually have it's possible like it, you could con contend with death in that kind of sense um and you know humanity as a whole has that sort of uncertainty like when you are like working as a carpenter like there just is like a set of practical realities that you have to wake up with and like you could end up like having a workplace injury or maybe your income stream is going to dry up whatever there's a, there's a level of like non-controllability and all, in all kinds of places in society and when i think when you have a political s society that tries to like as part of its justification for power to say actually we have way more under control it's all it's all fine it's all going to work that ends up eventually creating a kind of distrust of that segment of society. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, uh, it's 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 really helpful um, have you put it that way. Yeah, because for me, I guess the way I approach these things, and I, you know, this has undergirded a lot of our discussions here. It's that, you know, um, I've I've always been sort of always. Since college, I've been convinced that, you know, one certainly can't prove free will. And so yeah. as a result, you know, to, to function in our society, which from the most basic element of law uh, requires individual agency, you have to assume it. If you call that into doubt, like nothing is sensible. Everything is nonsense. But since it can't be proven, at least to my like any satisfaction i think if you like try and rigorously get into this stuff it's it's impossible you have to start all political discussions with the following i assume my as my starting premise that individuals have dignity free will agency and then this is what i like you know my sport on this podcast is just like you know pushing shoddy <laughs> to to further <laughs> You know, like lean into his his own religious convictions and justifying his very strong pro democracy stand. Because I don't think that democracy can be argued for without that as its foundational basis, and it's a religious one. It's a fundamentally it's a faith proposition. So democracy is not a, a rational case for what is good and et cetera. It is a case that has to start with that that. Now, you know, in many ways that's a pretty obvious statement and like anyone listening to it out of context will be like, Well, yeah, of course. You know, except not, of course, because, you know, most of the people that are the uh, 
the biggest believers in uh, democracy, democracy promotion, liberalism, and I, I know I'm sort of conflating a lot of things, they're also, uh, I think, increasingly atheists and technocrats. That's true. And, right. and, it's, right. and, and, and uh, it's that conjoining that I think leads to a lot of nonsense. Uh, because, because uh, um, you know, again, the faith proposition, the way you put it there, Sam, I think it, it acknowledges implicitly that there's a leap there. And that leap involves all that uncertainty, which is to say we have to assert or believe, however you want, yeah. uh, that that core tenet about what an individual is, what a human being is, what humanity is. Um, and, and, uh, and that leap just brings in all of that uncertainty, I think, in a very honest way. But that whereas, whereas like the liberal technocratic atheist approach smuggles in an undeserved sense of certainty about all the rest of that stuff into the discourse in a way that poisons everything in the way that you said, that basically allows common sense people that don't spend a lot of time thinking about this, listening to a bunch of these people and being like, you're all full of it. So are you suggesting, Demir, that it would be better for democracy promoters and advocates of liberalism to have faith? that it's precisely the fact that they believe in these things divorced from a kind of God-centeredness that creates this undeserved certainty. So I, I, that's one way of interpreting it. You're making a pro-religion case here. It's better It's well, better it, to have a religious foundation when I, I guess, we talk you know, about you know, democracy. You know, I'm not religious. That's why I'm, I'm pushing it on you to make that case, because you do have faith. But like, I, I think that, that where I come at it from is but that... Uh, while lacking faith, and and that makes me this sort of like more of a gadfly in these arguments, where I just point out the that the emperor has no clothes, rather than having a creative solution for it. But I'm coming from the same place as you, except you're in a more, much more positive. You're coming up from a more po positive thing because you have a um, an, <clears throat> an agency affirming faith, or like an individual affirming faith that undergirds where you're coming from. For me. Um, you know, I just sort of see people making all sorts of moves and all sorts of assertions, and I'm like, that's nonsense. You have, you're, you're not you're standing on nothing to make these sorts of claims. But and you so, just said that without without faith, that you do in effect believe in free will. So, uh, if I understood no, I, I said I said that 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 like I have um, in effect. You I said effectively... I, I said I I that like one can't exist in a society. You'd go mad if you actually don't believe anyone has free will. Like you'd right. go, you'd go insane. And the fact that you haven't gone insane suggests that you know by extension that you do believe that people have free will and agency. But this that's what gets us to the, to the Chat GPT essay and the provocation there because I don't know if you if you recall uh, and when when listeners read it. Um, I get to the point at the very end where I say, like, I'm not sure. I, I outline the negative case. I say that that what ChatGPT is perhaps showing us is that uh, that we're actually a lot less than we think we are. Like that, yeah. in fact, I we are. That that uh, you know what these breakthroughs might show is at its core the sort of insight I got from playing with ChatGPT is that the one thing mm -hmm. that we used to think was distinctive about human beings and sort of was connected to our individuality, our insolidness, our sort of uh, humanness, was language, our ability to do language. We couldn't program something that could, that could speak because language is too complicated and uh, it involves something ineffable about the individual that, that uh, and that was almost like a shorthand proof. We are agents, even if we don't know the exact mechanisms of how our agency works philosophically, but we are agents because of language. And like, I just had this sort of flash when playing with ChatGPT was like, oh shit, we figured out how to model language. And the essay that, that like I linked to at the beginning of that by Stephen Wolfram also makes that point, that like the big breakthrough of ChatGPT is to model human language, something that we thought was beyond modeling up until now. Um, and so, so, you know, my whole essay there is me actually going where I actually come down on these things, which is, you know, more of a, a pessimistic sort of nihilism about this, which is like, maybe there isn't, maybe agency and all these things aren't real. But you'll note at the end, I say, I'm not sure I believe all of this. I'm not sure that, that like, I, I will make the, the opposite leap into ultimate nihilism and say, none of it matters, we're all automatons and stuff like that. I'm just saying that 
uh, I feel like ChatGPT has struck a blow against a certain kind of certainty that like atheist techno technocrat liberals had about uh, you know the possibility of of human agency, um, and that like the bar is a lot higher for them to now prove that in some sort of non faith based way. I still think that the road to believing in human you know individuality and like dignity and and the individual and 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 in solidness is there and it's religion i absolutely believe that that's the that's the way out and if you accept that like all of modern society flows from it just fine you know but like i said i think the difference what you're saying like where i come from it where as opposed to where you come come at it from and i don't you know sam i think you're closer to shadi though i, I know you're you're much yeah. more deeply studied and have like all sorts of interesting variations on the theme but for me for me it's 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 that um how do i put it my skepticism allows me to bring in all of that indeterminacy we were talking about and like treat it i think seriously in a way mm -hmm. that your faith ought to let you do the same thing because it's the same move basically is to say like we actually don't know um that like that through normal human means and through normal sort of enlightenment scientific inquiry we've hit a wall into asserting uh, into being able to uh claim with any certainty that human beings exist you say well of course they do i believe that and i say well i'm not sure but i i'm not going to say that they don't because i don't think that's proven either i don't think chat gpt has proven that we're not uh, you know but i do think that from like a scientific perspective it's it's certainly more likely to have proven that we are less than we think we are rather than thinking that robots are you know getting smarter I've and been, getting closer to what we are i've been summarizing your essay as the so the thesis is the question is is chat gpt conscious and demir's response is no chat gpt proves that humans are not conscious yes right right no that's right that's that's sort of the the insight there and like i say at the end i'm not sure i believe it but it, I, it's meant as more of a provocation so like that was why I wanted Sam on here, because I knew from previous discussions before I was writing the essay, we've had furious debates about this. And, yeah, like uh, over Afghani food. Over Afghani food. Yeah. And it was the question was, is basically like convince me conv where have I gone off in my in my in my sort of thing? But Shadi, I mean, does that make sense? Like it what does. I'm getting it does. There? And it, it sort of it, it makes me think even more about it, the argument that I made in the Atlantic essay that knowledge is overrated and that ignorance is bliss. You know, that these, you know, a lot of the things you're talking about, even if they're true, it's better not to know them. So if if we as humans were, in fact, less than conscience, conscious, and we've been getting it wrong all this time and how we view that, like, I don't think it's helpful for a critical mass of human beings to realize that they're not conscious, if that is, in fact, true. Um, similarly, whether or not free will is exists or is real is um it's almost irrelevant to me because i people should behave and act and live as if as sort of as you just said yep. as if free will is real like there's no benefit to be had from having more insight into this fundamental question and i would actually urge people to not look into the free will debates unless you're really there is a risk of like no, no, Shani, this is where you're supposed to be telling people they should subscribe to the pod like this is, <laughs> this is the opposite way around That's I, not I, I would i would saying. advise people not to read demir's essay because yeah, don't, it may don't actually listen. be really bad for you we're now going to keep talking about free will for an hour and you should not listen to it that's not a good marketing pitch <laughs> or because or. people people like it's it, you know it's like the fire you know yeah. you tell people not to touch the fire and then they want the fire so right. it's counterintuitive because yeah. human beings are weird and complicated Shadi is I the am best reminded, marketer <laughs> <laughs> I am reminded however the fire so is on the other side of the paywall just so <laughs> you know so I just actually have been get, getting into the great um, Danish uh, film director Carl Theodore Dreyer um, and his great film, it's called Ordet in Danish. I'm not even entirely sure what that means in English. But anyway, that's what it's actually called, and you can find it on Criterion ch uh, Channel if you subscribe to that. But it's interesting. I only bring this up because there is a kind of amusing subplot where one of the family members basically loses his mind and starts 
to think that he's Jesus Christ. That's actually like this one of the subplots. But it's interesting how he gets to that point. So the problem is he starts studying theology and philosophy in a graduate program, and they literally blame his insanity on him reading Kierkegaard. <laughs> like that's actually like explicit. Like his father is like explaining why his kid is insane. And he's like, well, you know, we made a mistake, and he started studying this um, philosopher. <laughs> Self-loathing so, Danes, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I think there's, but, so, you know, all jokes aside, there is, I think, something important there that's worth pondering is, you know, not everyone has, you, you have to steel yourself for philosophy. You have to prepare yourself. And if you're going into philosophy in this deep study, without the requisite preparation, it can really mess you up. But I mean, I'd make the opposite case, which is that, um, so I think uh, going through a graduate program can really mess you up. I think that's true, uh, <laughs> totally. Uh, having spent a lot of my own life in that uh, state of life. Um, no, but I do think that a lot of what philosophy is, is just doing the most human thing, like genuinely the most human thing, which is, um, hey what the hell is this like that's that's basically the discipline and being able to do that i do think you know pretty much everyone is doing that in some basic sense and being able to do that with other people who are also in you know doing the same thing is good and it gives you a kind of confidence and it, it allows a kind of light and air into that room and it seems to me that actually it's one of the like least class ridden things that if you start asking questions like what is the meaning of life those are questions that um like i said earlier everyone um at harvard also doesn't know the answer to uh just like uh every you know everyone who's working doing working class jobs in um alabama also doesn't know the answer to and the capacity to like push into that sort of like I think I do think that that's sort of the purpose of uh, this uh, this podcast, which is let's press into questions that are actually so hard that we don't know the answers. And I think there's something about that that's and you know contest contend with different possibilities, like be able to have like strong views, but do it in a way that's genu genuinely unsure where we're going to end up. And I th I think that's actually a very dignifying activity. And yeah, I mean, you can end up in the wrong kind of places, but I think having a community around you helps you not do that much more than uh, than the opposite, which is just like avert your eyes, run away, don't touch it. Um, I just As think... Shadi is doing now with the news, <laughs> averting his eyes, running away. Yeah. But so Sam, you're saying there is something fundamentally egalitarian, even perhaps democratic about philosophy, that it does level the playing field. Yeah, for sure. And I, I actually think the history of like social radicalism uh, runs through philosophy in a lot of ways. There's this passage in uh, one of Plato's dialogues that I love where Socrates is talking to this young aristocrat and just gets totally fed up with it, like pompous arrogance of this kid and instead just goes and says like, I'm, I don't know, I don't think you understand anything. I'm gonna go talk to your, your slave instead. And uh, then from there, like all the insights of the dialogue show up and like start rolling out. And I, I think philosophy has always done something like that where it's like, it doesn't actually sit very well with, with hierarchy or social structure that's too strict. Hmm. Then where, where does the philosopher king as the kind of a benevolent dictator figure fit into this? Because I feel like when people think about philosophy, they think about people who have this rarefied knowledge who can then govern justly. Yeah, so th I, that's like one of the most misunderstood things in the entire history of philosophy. The, the primary point in Plato there is that, uh, you know, so Plato's great exemplar is Socrates. And w what is the principal characteristic of Socrates? That he's told that he's the wisest man in the world. And he says, oh, no, that's definitely not true. And then he goes away and you realize, oh, the reason that I'm the wisest man in the world is because I at least know that I don't know anything, in contrast to all of these other people who think that they actually t have it totally buttoned down. So, like, you know, if Plato's, like, recommending a philosopher king, like, his best exemplar is the guy who like is very very clear that he knows nothing at all yeah sure so it's, but it's the op it's the opposite of the kind of like but at the same time again like not to get like so bogged down in, in like the republic but then like at you know as the republic goes on and it sort of goes off socrates goes off his script of being like the 
the dumb fool like oh i don't know anything huh? and then like <laughs> you know like later on he's just like and this is what the just society looks like and it seems like a pretty detailed blueprint no 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 that he doesn't arrive at doesn't arrive at dialectically by quizzing, already by quizzing this peasants, for hours. but it's actually not... he's just like here's how it rolls like we've got guardians and then we got smart no, people no, no. and then we got the philosopher king etc cetera, etc cetera. okay let's not let's not necessarily yeah, we, go that, we'll get we'll get very far afield but that's definitely not the right reading of the republic let's just like <laughs> This is like now firmly in my wheelhouse. So. <laughs> oh.